put it down that you'd like it shared will be shared. A couple other quick announcements to draw your attention to this evening. And uh, if you have a message idea for the What Jesus Really Said series, please let me know right away because this series is quickly coming to an end, but we can always extend it and continue on if you have other topic ideas or things that you'd like more information about. Uh, some upcoming special events on Wednesday evenings, we have our Awana Clubs and youth group. It's a small group of kids, uh, but we're thankful for college students from Moody Bible Institute who helps us minister to the kids. I'm out in the parking lot playing basketball, but I gotta tell you, either the kids are getting better or I'm getting older, but uh, I mostly I just watch at this point, I think. But it's still a lot of fun, and uh, that's our Wednesday evening outreach to youth. If you want to be a part of it or just pray for us, that's the best thing you can do. Mm -hmm. And on Wednesdays, we also have our 7 p.m. Bible study, the Sermon on the Mount. So join us for that Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Looking forward, next Sunday is going to be a special service here in the church. It's going to be Testimony Sunday. So on Sunday morning, we will have uh, four individuals from church that are going to be sharing uh, personal testimonies of God's salvation and grace and mercy in their lives. And in the evening, we're going to have an open mic time uh, that I will be sort of emceeing and give you all a chance to share your testimony of what God has done in your life. Love to have a nice group come out that night and really praise the Lord together about His goodness and grace. So that's next Sunday evening. Jason, I'm going to do I'm going to do uh, one of the Psalms. I'm, I'm going to look forward to it. And Psalms. Yeah, I mean, you, you can come and read a scripture. That's what I'm gonna do. If uh, you want to give a testimony and song, you can come and sing a brief song. You know, not something like 12 long. minutes, uh, 1970s rock anthem or something. But, you know, something's, <laughs> you know what I mean. All right, fall <laughs> picnic at the Forest Reserve, Sunday, October 8th. And uh, if you want to be a part of that, it'll be Sunday afternoon. A couple hours over at the Forest Reserve, just enjoying the beauty of God's creation together. And that's coming up on Sunday. Don't get lost. Don't get lost. <laughs> and our trick-or-treater outreach is coming up Tuesday, October 31st. Uh, we don't celebrate Halloween. We don't celebrate violence, evil, or death. Uh, but we do know a lot of kids walk down our sidewalks on October 31st. And so we'd like to pass out candy and give them the good news of Jesus. So if you want to be a part of that, we have a candy collection box in the back. It's orange, which goes along with the season. And you can be a part of that. Operation Christmas Child Collection Week yes. is November 12th through 19th. Yes. And this morning, even though it's two months away, this morning we had our very first Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes. And that special prize goes to Angela Panowski. Good job, Angela. Yeah. Who's going to be our second person to bring in the shoe box? Yeah, right back there. Marvin is waving his hand around. Is not going to tonight. Uh, yeah, we've got uh, Candy. Oh, don't break anything. Candy, any question? I want to recognize we have a couple of birthdays uh, tonight. Uh, first of all, we recognize Jose. Oh, yeah. Let's give him a nice round of applause. <laughs> and uh, Anita in the other room with our bullet in the other room. Let's give her a nice round of applause. <laughs> Glad to see you. We're, we're applauding for birthdays, uh, but we're happy to see you too. God bless you. <laughs> and looking forward, uh, Mikhailo has a birthday coming up along with uh, others in our extended church family, so we're very thankful for all of them. Let's take a look at our memory verse of the week, and then we'll invite Dwight to come for our word of encouragement. Mark 2, 27 through 28 in your bulletin. Again, Mark 2, 27 through 28. Let's read or recite it together. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Amen. Mark 2, 27 through 28. Amen. And this time, I invite our brother Dwight to make his way to the front, as Dwight is going to share with us a word of encouragement. We're excited to hear uh, what God has laid on your heart. Let's give Dwight a little bit. Good morning. I'm going to watch that. Tonight, I'd like to share with you from uh, Romans. 
chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not conform to, the, to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind by, by testing and discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You know, <clears throat> present yourself to God. We can fully trust in God because he is fully trustworthy. Given an absolute power to another human being would be an imitating with proposition. But that's the way through when we come to the Lord. Unconditional surrender to him is joyous. But to do so, we must, number one, yield ourselves to the Lordship of Christ. Identifying with the Lord is by surrendering all that we have and all that we are, we decrease. Jesus is increasing. And the first place of surrender must occur is in our attitude. Then we live in and out obedient action. Number two, place no limit on what we are willing to do or become. This means we have no uh, restricted areas in our heart. Restricted areas in our heart. Can't read my own writing. <clears throat> Life here where Jesus is not invited. Also, nothing is set aside from our exclusively used. We want to make ourselves totally available to God's will. Number three, transfer ownership of our body, soul, and spirit to Christ. By doing so, we embrace the principle of the Beulotites and the hierarchy of the kingdom. Matthew 5, 3 to 12, and uh, Mark 9, 35. Giving up control of our life can feel scary. But when we put it in fully in God's hand, only God can resolve. Can, uh, resolve. So my question for you is what is keeping you from abandoning yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ? You'll live a pretty wild idea, but it's hard. It would be kind of hard to imagine doing that, giving up your body to Christ, totally committed, totally to him, and sacrificing your life for him, like he did for us. But we you know that's what we should do. We should uh, <clears throat> recognize him as who he is, the Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and that we should bow down and worship him constantly and to give our uh, whole life to him. So I just hope it's a little bit of a word of encouragement, of an encouragement to you tonight. And let's uh, stand for prayer. Lord Jesus, we just want to thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. And Lord, we know that you are the Lord of Lord and King of Kings. And we come here together tonight into your house to worship you, sing praises to you, and to shout with victory what you have done for us, O oh Lord. The Lord, we just ask all this in our your holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. As we are um, talking about peace um, and tonight we're talking about the Sabbath, um, we're going to open up with a prayer to God. Um, Prayers the, of the Lord that we need Him every step of the way. So join me as we sing. Lord, I need. I don't know. Mm -hmm.
With the blowing of a hollowed out ram's horn known as the shofar, calls to repent from sin and return to God, special symbolic practices like taking breadcrumbs and tossing them onto the waters, symbolize the discarding of sins, to an emphasis upon charitable acts and warm family gatherings and sweet treats like apples and honey. honey. Rosh Hashanah is a time to wish one another sweet hopes for the new year, time of celebration and reflection. So I want to invite you, if you want to stay after service for just like five extra minutes, enjoy apple slices dipped in honey with us, and it'll be a nice time to celebrate Rosh Hashanah as it comes to a conclusion this evening. <laughs> now, we as Christians, of course, we're not bound to celebrate the Holy Days, festivals, new moons, Sabbaths, and other ceremonial gatherings and festivities that are proclaimed in the Old Testament. Those things are shadows of the fullness of our hope, which is found in Jesus. Many people wonder what Jesus had to say about Jewish holidays, and a lot of Christians wonder what Jesus had to say about the Sabbath in particular. And so this evening, as we continue our series, what Jesus actually said, we're considering what Jesus actually said about the Sabbath. Everybody say that with me. The, the Sabbath. Sabbath. The Sabbath. Very good. Now, in terms of the Sabbath, along with other special days that God has put onto the calendar, in the book of Genesis, the very first chapter, it says that God placed the lights in the heavens the sun, moon, stars, in the heavens to mark out days and times and seasons. And so those days and times and seasons are especially related to the calendar of remembrance. And so having special days set aside for remembrance, I believe, is an appropriate thing to do, though we don't need to be bound by these things. Jesus not only fulfilled Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, by his once and all final sacrifice upon the cross, we know that he also commemorated the Feast of Booths, also known as Tabernacles or Sukkot, 
in John chapter 7. He even recognized Hanukkah, as Brad has mentioned, as 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 the Feast of Dedication in John chapter 10. And of course, Jesus celebrated Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, pointing to his sinless life and his saving sacrifice. Even, and this is pretty cool, even Jesus' perfectly timed resurrection on the first day after the Passover Sabbath was clearly timed to fulfill the Feast of First Fruits, with Christ himself being the first fruits of the resurrection of the dead. And you might remember that it was Pentecost, a celebration of the law being given to Moses on Mount Sinai, that the Holy Spirit descended in tongues of fire upon the Christians gathered in the upper room, fulfilling the prophecy of the law being written on the people's hearts. Now, with regard to this weekend's Rosh Hashanah celebration and the blowing of the shofar trumpets, what does Jesus have to say? King Jesus says that his return will be accompanied by a, quote, loud trumpet call. Or as the apostle writes, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain. Now, Jesus is clear that we don't know the day, the time, or the hour. And so I don't think he's saying that the return of the king, Jesus, is going to happen on Rosh Hashanah. But I believe that the blowing of the shofars on Rosh Hashanah is a prefiguring, a foreshadowing, a pointing forward to that great trumpet that will accompany the Lord's return. And while Rosh Hashanah is the head of the year, when Jesus comes, that will be a brand new beginning. And so we long for as Christians that day. Why don't let's talk about Jesus and Jewish holy days? Because today we're going to talk about the one that comes up every single week. A special day, a day set apart, a day set aside. Sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, the Sabbath. What did Jesus say about the Sabbath? When you look at the Gospels, it's a major topic. In the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the word Sabbath occurs some 50 times in 45 verses. We read of Jesus. In the synagogue, on the Sabbath, going, as was his custom, teaching the people, casting out demons, healing diseases and infirmities. We read how the Sabbath day sadly became a major source of conflict, the sore spot in Jesus' relationship with the scribes and Pharisees. And we observe that the Sabbath itself figures prominently in the passion and death and resurrection accounts as recorded in all four Gospels. So the Sabbath is worthy of a closer look. Let's take a closer look at what Jesus had to say about the Sabbath. First of all, when it comes to the Sabbath and the Old Covenant, we must reiterate a very important point that Jesus makes in his Sermon on the Mount, something we just studied in greater detail than we will do tonight, studied last Wednesday in our Bible study. Jesus makes it very clear he came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Many people have subscribed to a false teaching, which we could call a heresy, that the God of the New Testament is not the same God as the God of the Old Testament. The God of the Old Testament is a God of war and anger and law. And the God of the New Testament is a God of love and peace and spiritual energy. And so there's two different gods, some proclaim. No, there is one God. Only one God. One God, eternally existing as three persons, Father, Son, and and Holy Spirit. Amen. One God, which means that this book, though made up of 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, this is one book with ultimately one author, and that author being God. The continuous narrative being the story of redemption and salvation. And who is the hero of the story of redemption? Jesus. 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 Who's the one saved by the hero? Me and you. That's the story of redemption. All right, so Jesus says in Matthew 5, 17, that's where we'll start. Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. An iota is the smallest marking in the Greek alphabet. A 
A dot is the smallest marking in the Hebrew alphabet. So he neither relaxed nor set aside even the smallest commandment. Jesus did not relax or set aside even the smallest commandment. He says in verse 19, Matthew 5, Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus did not relax or set aside even the smallest commandment. And I believe that means that he did not come to abolish the Sabbath. He did not come to set it aside or to discard it. But we know that Jesus offers a correct interpretation of the law and a correct application of it, sometimes in contradiction to the observers and religious people of his day. So we see, therefore, since he did not relax or set aside the smallest commandment, therefore Jesus did not set aside the Sabbath commandment. I want you to flip in your Bibles back to the Ten Commandments. Anybody know what chapter in Exodus we read of the Ten Commandments? Exodus chapter 20. Excellent. Exodus 20 verse 8 says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. How many of you, when you were in public school, memorized the Ten Commandments? Anybody? There was a time in America, Dwight, okay, thank you, Dwight. There was a time in American history where the Ten Commandments were memorized in public schools, recited by children, and appeared on the walls. Huh. And, boy, it's to our detriment that we as a society appear to have forgotten. This is commandment number four. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. The seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You are your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your livestock, sojourners within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. That means he set it apart as something special and sacred. The reason given in Exodus 20 is because God created the world and the heavens and all that is in them in how many days? Six days. Appropriate to remember on this Rosh Hashanah celebration of God's creation of the world. In six days, God worked and spoke this universe as we know it and experience it into existence. On the seventh day, what did he do? He rested. He rested. He rested. So God has built into his good creation, this good rhythm of hard work and rest. Six days of work, one day of rest. The rhythm God has built into his creation, into his plan. Let's take a look together at another place where the Ten Commandments are repeated. Anybody know where that is? Deuteronomy chapter 6. How's my Spanish there? A little better than my Feliz Dia de la Independencia, which is really... Sorry to all the Spanish speakers out there for that. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 12. It says, Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, and then we have the same commandment spelled out for us. But a different reason is given. This time, not just because of the rhythm of creation, six days of work, one day of rest, now we're told, verse 15, Deuteronomy 5, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So the Sabbath day was to be also a remembrance of how God had brought them out of Egypt. So if Jesus did not abolish the law, that means that he did not set aside the Sabbath. And we learn from the Gospels that Jesus kept the Sabbath as a custom. Luke 4, verse 16, I think is key at this point. So, flipping from the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, now to the New Testament, the Gospels. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Jesus 
is in his hometown, in Nazareth, where he opens up the prophet Isaiah chapter 61, and he will say boldly before them all, this scripture about the Messiah and the salvation he will bring, the liberation he will proclaim, this prophecy is fulfilled in your hearing. He will say there in Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. Welcome. God bless you guys. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. But what we sometimes miss is what it says. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. What's the next phrase say? Anybody got it? As was his custom. Can everybody say that with me? As was his custom. As was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. So Jesus made it his custom to gather with God's people on this day for rest and renewal and worship and fellowship. So in this series, we've been considering what Jesus actually said on the topics, and tonight is Sabbath. <coughs> but when we think about what Jesus actually said, we also want to look at what Jesus actually did. Sometimes people will ask me if I'm a Christian or what religion do you subscribe to? And I'm tempted to say, instead of I'm a Christian, to say I'm a follower of the teachings of Jesus. Just to kind of set them off guard a little bit and maybe start a different conversation than the religious conversation we often get into. And then we can start talking more about Jesus and what attached to Jesus and be a follower and adherent of the teachings of Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, that means that you are going to observe this practice of setting aside a day of the week where you gather for worship, fellowship, renewal, refreshment, rest with God's people. Jesus said that as a custom, and I believe he was honoring the rhythm of the Sabbath. What is the rhythm of the Sabbath? It's six days of work. <laughs> One day of rest. All right, say that again. What is the rhythm of the Sabbath? Six days, days of, of work and one, one day, day of rest. And some of us get that flipped around and we think God commanded one day of work and six days of rest. That's not no, how, that's it. how it works. I want to say... <laughs> When it comes to the Sabbath, sometimes we think of this as yet one more obligation. So, Pastor Jason, are you really saying that we should be observing the Sabbath? That just sounds like an unpleasant, not very fun sort of thing. And I picture a scene from uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder in Little House on the Prairie where she's sitting there on her little wooden bench with her Bible on her lap and not allowed to move until the sun sets. Is that, is that what... Jesus is talking about, nope. as a Christian, we tend to set aside the first day of the week, the Lord's Day. Sunday is a day for fellowship, worship, and renewal. I remember as a kid, it was proclaimed, especially by some of the older Christians in my life, that you weren't supposed to really do anything on, on the Lord's Day. It was, you go to church, you go home and eat, and Boy, Grandma sure worked really hard on the Lord's Day making dinner. I'll tell you, my mom did, too. Uh, apparently, it was okay for them to work really hard making the food that we were going to eat for Sunday dinner. Anyway, but you were supposed to rest. And, boy, you know, video games were out. Um, I love going outside with my dad and playing catch with the baseball. And so if it was a beautiful spring or summer day, I'd be like, yeah, let's go outside and play catch. But I remember when a certain relative was visiting our house, we went outside and played baseball. Hey, it's the Lord's Day. No sports on Sunday. <laughs> I remember one time visiting a relative's uh, home. They lived on a lake. And it was a beautiful Sunday, summer afternoon. We went to church, and we also were preparing to go to evening service. But in between, we were going to go out in the boat and fish. And so we took the little rowboat out, and we were fishing out there on Guernsey Lake. And I don't know what happened. The wind came up, and we had a hard time getting the boat back into shore, and water started coming into the boat, and we started to sink a little bit. And here comes my relative down the hill from the house, <laughs> looks at us struggling to get the boat in, and shouts out to us, that's what you get for fishing on Sunday. Now, is that what Jesus meant when he said, no? Nope. Okay, let me tell you. Not all. The Sabbath is a day 
of joyful rest in the Lord. When we honor this rhythm of work and rest, which, by the way, completes uh, bearing my soul to you, I've never been successful in this. I'm trying, by God's grace. As a pastor, I have realized that the sort of most appropriate day for me to set aside is a personal day of rest and reflection. Monday seems to work pretty well right now in my current rhythm. But I've been trying for several, uh, a couple months now, and I haven't been very successful. <laughs> so pray for me as I pray for you that we can begin to honor this rhythm of work and rest with the Sabbath in our lives. It's not something to be observed slavishly. It's not just another burden to keep on, but rather a joyful offering from the Lord. Okay, we've got to move rather quickly now as we continue on. Surprisingly, you might say, well, wait a minute, you just said that Jesus observed the Sabbath as a custom. Surprisingly, Jesus had a reputation for not keeping the Sabbath. He had a reputation for not keeping the Sabbath. You can look up the scriptures later that I listen in your bulletin, but one time he allowed his disciples to pluck grain on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees said, well, wait a minute, what are they doing? So Jesus and his disciples were walking on the Sabbath. They were walking by a grain field, and it was allowable, according to the law, that passers-by could take a little bit of the edges of the field to feed themselves. And the Pharisees, making a hedge about the law, making the Sabbath into a burden to be borne by the people, said that you're not allowed to harvest on the Sabbath. And picking a little bit of grain as you walked along the road was akin to harvesting the grain. And so that was completely out of place. They confronted Jesus. Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? Jesus said, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God, took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, gave it also to those who were with him. And then Jesus said, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Just as he is Lord over all humanity, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. Luke chapter 6, verse 6, another story showing that not only did he allow his disciples to pluck grain on the Sabbath, he healed diseases and infirmities on the Sabbath. This is all over the Gospels. In Luke 6, there's a man with a withered hand. And he entered the synagogue, Jesus did, as was his custom, on another Sabbath. He was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was withered. So I don't know what that means exactly, but it was crippled. He, he couldn't use it. And the scribes and Pharisees were watching Jesus. Why? Because they were interested to see if he had the power to heal this man? Partly, but their motivation was not good. <coughs> They were watching to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. So they might find a reason to accuse him. The reason to accuse him is not just like they want to shake their fingers at Jesus and be like, ah, 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 don't do that. <laughs> no, the reason to accuse him means they want to find a legal reason for an indictment. They want to be able to bring Jesus to court and find him guilty. So they're watching him. They're trying to catch him. He knew their thoughts, and he said to the man with the withered hand, come up here and stand. Now, I love this. Jesus, we learned last week, the angel said, came to bring peace on earth. But remember what Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace on earth, but a sword. Here we see that Jesus, while he comes to bring peace by his shed blood upon the cross, Jesus, in this case, initiates conflict. He says in front of the synagogue, man, come up here. The man comes up front. Imagine that this happened here at our church, okay? Person comes in crippled. Jesus is up here teaching. Come on up front of the church. Comes up in front of the synagogue. He stands there next to Jesus. Jesus looks at them. Another passage says he looked at them in anger. And he said to the man, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? <coughs> After looking around them all, he said to the man, stretch out your hand, and he did so, and guess what? That withered, crippled hand was restored. It was restored and healed immediately by Jesus. And how did the scribes and Pharisees respond? 
Oh my goodness, Jesus healed the man. This is so exciting. We got to see it with our own two eyes. You know, like a lot of religious hypocrites, <laughs> they were filled with fury that Jesus healed on the Sabbath and showed them up as he was doing so. We don't have time to go through all the other passages of, of Jesus healing on the Sabbath, but it seems like he specifically, purposely healed on the Sabbath to help people understand what the point of the Sabbath was. A woman with a disabling spirit, Jesus healed her on the Sabbath. Uh, in Luke chapter 13, Luke chapter 14, a person with a case of, of dropsy, we're not sure exactly what that is, maybe seizures, we don't know, but Jesus healed on the Sabbath. And said, look, if you got a son or a cow or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath, won't you go get them out immediately? How much more ought we to help out a person on the Sabbath? But they could not understand or comply with these things. John chapter 5, Jesus heals on the Sabbath. John chapter 9, Jesus opened the eyes of a blind man on the Sabbath. People said, well, this man can't be of God. And the blind man said, well, I don't know, I I was blind and now I see. How can you deny what happened, this miracle? Well, he's a sinner because he healed of the Sabbath. That's what the religious hypocrites said. So I want to take a step back for a moment and point out Jesus had a reputation, a bad reputation with the religious leader. Sometimes if you're following Jesus, if you're walking in the steps of his life and love, you might develop a bad reputation with even religious people around you. Jesus certainly did. If we're following him, we may as well. Jesus spoke out against the Pharisees who slavishly observed the Sabbath. He said they were tying up burdens that were too heavy for the people to bear. Jesus said that they were making these burdensome laws and not even lifting a finger to help people carry them. Jesus said that they were closing the doors of the kingdom of heaven so that they nor the people they're ministering to would enter it. Quite an indictment that Jesus offers and brings against the Pharisees before God. Jesus clarified also the purpose of the Sabbath. What is the purpose of the Sabbath? Mark chapter 2, verse 27, our memory verses of the week. Mark chapter 2 and verse 27. Where do we read this? He said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. What does he mean by that? The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It's not just another religious ritual or regulation or law, but rather it's meant to be a life-giving, joyful rest for God's people. It's a gift from God to the people. We weren't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was God's gift to us, Jesus said. It's a beneficial day for humanity. It's a life-giving day for doing good. When Jesus healed a man with a withered hand, he says in verse 4, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? So let's say that you are listening to God's word and listening to what Pastor Jason is saying and saying, okay, Jesus observed the Sabbath. Jesus did not abolish the law in his coming. He fulfilled it. I want to honor God's design for a rhythm of work and rest in my life. And you say, all right, I'm going to set aside this particular day. For many Christians, that day is the Lord's Day, Sunday. I'm going to set aside Sunday as a day to gather with God's people, a day to fellowship with friends and family, a day to enjoy God's creation, a day to do things that will bring me life. And let's say Sunday afternoon around 2 o'clock, you just watch the Bears lose again, and then you decide to take a little nap. And so th this is my afternoon, by the way. Watch the Bears lose again, uh, took a nice nap, and missed my alarm. Got hurt a little bit late, actually. Almost didn't have dinner were it not for father and son pizza showing up in the last second. So praise the Lord for that. Anyway, so let's say you get a call about 3 o'clock Sunday afternoon, your Sabbath day, a day of rest. And it's a friend. And a friend says, oh, my goodness, the storm last night knocked out my power. And everything in my freezer is going to go bad. i got a bunch of steaks and meats there. And everything in my fridge, the milk, the eggs, it's all going to go bad. Can you please come over to my house? Can you help me? Can you bring these things uh, to your freezer, to your fridge? And you say, I would love to help, brother. 
oh, I wish I could come over and help you, but I'm going to tell you, it's the Sabbath, and I've chosen the day to rest, so I'm not going to be able to help you. Is that what Jesus meant? No. No, of course not. Oh. Of course that's not what Jesus meant. Oh. And so Jesus makes it very plain. The Sabbath is a beneficial day for humanity, a joyful day, a life-giving day for doing good. We can be careful to rest, and yet we also want to follow Jesus' own example. Jesus also claimed lordship over the Sabbath. What does it mean when we say that Jesus is Lord? Jesus is Lord. In one sense, it means Jesus is God. Lord is Yahweh, the name for God. But we're also saying, like a fifth grader might say, <coughs> Jesus rules. Jesus rules. Jesus rules in favor of Sabbath rest. Jesus rules in favor of Sabbath rest. He observes it himself, and he says to all of us, like in Matthew chapter 11, Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says to people burdened down by religious weights and the works of the law, he says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. 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 I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Jesus is Lord over the Sabbath. The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And so he rules in favor of Sabbath rest. And Jesus rules out slavish observance of Sabbath regulations. He rules out slavish observance of Sabbath regulations. Remember what Galatians 5, 1 says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Do not submit, therefore, again, to a yoke of slavery. Being yoked together with Christ means that we are submitting to him to his lordship in his life, but we are not slaves to religious rules and rituals. We are not slaves to the law, as Galatians 5.1 so clearly proclaims. Christ has set us free. The Sabbath, the holidays, ultimately these are shadows that point to Jesus, but fullness is found in Christ. And finally... Not only does Jesus rule in favor of Sabbath rest, not only does Jesus our Lord rule out slavish observance of Sabbath regulations, but Jesus himself is the key to entering God's Sabbath rest. How many of you have read the book of Hebrews before? In the book of Hebrews, one thing you'll find when you read is that the Sabbath that God commands us to remember and to keep now as a day of rest actually points forward to eternity to come. Actually points forward to the promised land, the new Jerusalem, the life that we will have together forever with the Lord. Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. Rest from the burden of guilt and shame. Rest from the regrets that you have about the past. Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. Rest from the struggle against temptation and sin. Now you say, okay, I experienced that in part in Jesus, but I also still have both shame and the regret. I still struggle with sin and temptation. Yeah. Yeah, because we're still living in this current world. We're still living in this body of flesh. Who will deliver us from this body of flesh? Thanks be to God for the victory that we have in Christ Jesus our Lord. But Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 4 that we still await a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Hebrews 4 verse 9 says, There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Paradoxically, the author of Hebrews says, let us therefore strive to enter that rest. What does that mean? How do we enter that rest? Jesus himself is the key to entering God's Sabbath rest. The scripture proclaims that Jesus is the great high priest 
He passed through the heavens. Jesus is the Son of God. And so we hold fast to our confession of faith. We persevere in the faith, come what may. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us in our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted and tried in every way, even as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The very first step to experiencing the true rest, the Sabbath rest that Jesus offers to us, is to come to Jesus, to lay your burden at the foot of the cross, to confess, yes, I've sinned. And the ground is level at the foot of the cross. There isn't somebody who's more deserving of Jesus. There isn't somebody who's less deserving of Jesus. The ground is completely level at the foot of the cross. And so we come to Jesus. We confess our sin. We humble ourselves. We say, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. And we look up to the cross where Jesus died. His sacrifice, which is our sufficient, once for all, final sacrifice for, for sin. We say, Jesus, I believe that you died in my place. I believe that you died in my behalf. And as we look up to that cross, we see that Jesus is no longer hanging there because he who died was buried and he conquered death and he ascended from the grave. He ascended to heaven, the Holy Spirit given. We say, Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and you rose from the grave on the third day. And we cry out to the Lord. For he is the door. He is the gate to enter the Sabbath rest of God. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Say that again with me. I will give you rest. Gracious Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus, Lord of the Sabbath. Only through Jesus can we enter into the fullness of your Sabbath rest. I pray for any tonight who have never trusted in Jesus as their Savior, whether listening online or here in person with us, I pray, God, that this very evening you might draw them to our Savior Jesus to find rest, Sabbath rest. For us who are followers of Jesus, help us not to so quickly set aside the Sabbath that maybe we were taught to do when we were younger. Help us not to so quickly set aside the customs of Jesus in his own life. Help us not to so quickly set aside the things that Jesus taught. Help us, God, to really wrestle with this idea of rest, this rhythm of work and rest, and setting aside a day to give to you for rest, renewal, and refreshment for us. We know, God, that when we honor the principle of Sabbath rest, you will supercharge the other six days of work. Help us to honor you as our Savior Jesus, our Lord Jesus taught us. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. And all those people said, Amen. 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 Thank you so much, everybody, for coming today. So glad that you uh, joined us. It's been a very wonderful evening from, uh, from birthday cakes and food to the chosen to our worship service. I want to let